Hello and welcome to KGW News at 5 o'clock. I'm Ms. May 5th. Happy Cinco de Mayo. And we have some really good news to share with you about the very first patient diagnosed with COVID-19 in Oregon. Remember that? That was on February 28th. He is finally out of the hospital. That story is coming up in just a moment. But first, I want to tell you what else today is. It's Giving Tuesday now. Now you may be thinking, wait a minute, I've heard of Giving Tuesday, but isn't that closer to the holidays? Well, it usually is on the Tuesday after Cyber Monday in late November, but this year it's being moved to today, May 5th, in response to the crisis that we're in. The CEO of Giving Tuesday writes, Giving Tuesday now is a chance for us to stand united and use grassroots generosity to show that we're all in this together, beginning to end. Even as many face financial uncertainty, generosity is not about size. Every act of kindness is not only a beacon of hope, it's a critical act of civic and social solidarity. This is a way for us all to show our support for our frontline workers, grassroots organizations, and unsung heroes. We have a list of ways you can donate on our webpage, kgw.com. If you're in a position to help, please consider Giving Tuesday now. And we thank you for your compassion, your can-do spirit, and unending generosity. Together, we can make a difference. And now to our top story on this Tuesday, May 5th, and it is wonderful news indeed. The first person in Oregon to test positive for COVID-19 is finally out of the hospital. That's Hector Calderon, was discharged from Kaiser Westside Medical Center after more than two months of treatment. An ICU nurse promised Calderon a mariachi band and parade when he recovered, and boy, did they deliver. Staff you see there lined the hallways as he was led out to a mariachi band playing music outside. Thank you so much for all your hard work. Caring for Hector uh, while he was here at Kaiser Westside was an incredible honor for this team of nurses. Um, and they should be incredibly proud of the work they've done over the last two months. Not only have they made it so that Hector gets to walk out of here and see his family, um, they helped create the first COVID only unit in the state and that is something they should be incredibly proud of. Calderon is a custodian at Forest Hills Elementary in Lake Oswego and talked about how much he cannot wait to see the students and staff there once he is fully recovered. Hector, that is some of the best news we could hear today. So glad you're out of the hospital. Today, at least one business owner defied Oregon Governor Kate Brown's order to stay shut down. It's a sign of a desperation being felt by some. But Pat Doris found out most owners are following the governor's guidelines. The woman in the black mask there at the door is Lindsey Graham. She's the owner of Glamour Salon in Salem, and she has just let the first customer in the door since reopening. The only problem is that's technically illegal under the governor's executive orders to enforce social distancing and slow the spread of the coronavirus. Graham said she needs to provide for her family. I can't speak for other businesses. I can speak for other business owners. I know that they need to make a living. If they can open their business safely, I would encourage that. Um, I just, I can only speak for myself. And, and what I need is to provide for my family. Oregon has more than 24,000 licensed barbers, hair designers, and natural hair practitioners. There is no doubt that all have felt some pain from the shutdown but Graham is one of the few to openly defy the law. It made us wonder how other business owners are feeling. The National Federation of Independent Businesses, with 300,000 mostly small companies, released a nationwide survey today on that very question. They found that 77% had successfully submitted applications for the Federal Payroll Protection Program, and 61% already had that money in their bank accounts. 46% said they support opening the economy immediately, but 54% said they would wait a month or longer, or whenever health experts say so. 43% worry a lot about getting their customers back, and 38% worry about having enough hand sanitizer when they do reopen. Another indicator of how things are going can be found in rental units, as in who was able to pay rent last month. Despite significant worries, it turns out most did in Oregon. Deborah Imsey is the executive director of Multifamily Northwest, which represents large and small landlords covering 250,000 units across the state. Unpaid rents of somewhere between 5 to 18% for the month of April 
And frankly, that was better than uh, many of us anticipated. She said typically about 2% do not pay, so the number is higher than normal and bad for some landlords. But overall, not that bad. And there's always the chance that May could be worse. We are very worried about May. Um, the, there remains issues with uh, unemployment and stimulus checks and folks that may have had a little bit in reserve that they could come up with for April. Um, we're just very concerned that May is going to be uh, much tougher. So, yes, one business in Salem opened up against the governor's order because the owner said the economic pain is just too much. But many others are hanging on, at least for now. We checked with the Oregon State Police. They said they did not issue any tickets or fines there. We also talked with OSHA, and they wouldn't say what they're up to, but they did point out that a willful violation of their rules comes with a minimum $8,900 fine. A spokeswoman for the governor's office said that the governor is aware that some businesses are opening in violation of her order. They called the behavior irresponsible and unfortunate and said that business owners are putting the public at risk. Stay tuned for more on this one. In Northeast Portland, Pat Doris, KGW News. Some state parks and outdoor recreation areas in Oregon are reopening tomorrow. This is a gradual reopening and it's not happening all at once. Very popular places like the gorge and the coast are still closed. Outdoor recreation providers are working with the Air Oregon Health Authority to reopen parks and nature areas slowly and to keep people safe. The governor's office also says she will issue an executive order that will allow ski resorts to start operating once again. Meantime, Washington State restarted many recreational opportunities today. Fishing and hunting are back on. Also, most state parks open for day use only. State parks on Washington's coast, however, remain closed. Same goes for the gorge. Officials say check ahead and stay close to home. Golf is also being allowed again in Washington if it can be done safely with social distancing in mind. Now to some other big news we're following. Oregon House Speaker Tina Kotek is calling for a state representative to step down after seven people, mostly women, accused him of sexual harassment in the workplace. A House special committee yesterday ordered Representative Diego Hernandez, a Democrat out of Portland, not to contact his accusers. He's also been ordered to give 24 hours notice before showing up to work. Those measures will remain in place while an independent investigator looks into the allegations. Hernandez blamed the ordeal on an organized campaign to get him removed from office. He added, due process matters. I ask that people withhold judgment until the investigation is complete. We'll have much more on this tonight at 6 o'clock on The Story. An Oregon man thought he was donating $75 on his tax form for schools, but instead the state took more than $1,000. Why? As KGW's Kylie Boshi explains, the kicker donation is all or nothing. Michael Miller thought he was doing a good deed by donating a portion of his kicker rebate to Oregon school children. Helping the local schools. The Portland man checked a box marked kicker donation on a state income tax return. And in the following column, Michael said his TurboTax app automatically inserted an amount of $75. $75 is a lot of money, but it was going to the school fund. And I know the schools are always in need of help, especially now. So we decided $75, we can sacrifice $75. Michael didn't think much of the donation until he received a letter from the Oregon Department of Revenue several weeks right. later. Yeah, the state agency the notified school. Michael his tax return was being adjusted to reflect a much larger kicker donation. Instead of a $75 donation for schools, the state would be taking $1,100, his entire kicker rebate. It should have been clear that it was taking the entire kicker, yeah. To make matters worse, the decision that. to donate was irrevocable. I was upset. Irrevocable is a pretty heavy term. It's all of your kicker or none of your kicker. Rich Hoover, spokesperson for the Oregon Department of Revenue, explained it's important to read the fine print. The tax instructions explain you can't donate just a portion of the kicker rebate on your tax return. The only option is for to donate all of your kicker or none of it. Instead, if taxpayers want to donate a portion, they should claim all their kicker credit. Then, once they receive it, donate by writing a check to the State Department of Education. For Michael, there may be some relief. Because of the coronavirus pandemic, 
the due date for state income tax returns to be filed has been extended. The Department of Revenue says he can file an amended return. Kyle Aboshi, KGW News. Well, that's good to hear. Since the pandemic started, we've been reporting on the widespread partial closures of restaurants. Many announced temporary closures. Now several are announcing permanent closures. But one popular Portland restaurant wants to set the record straight and let everyone know, despite some recent reports, it is not going anywhere. It's coming back. I have a lease here. Of course it's coming back. That's the message from Clyde Common co-owner Nate Tilden. The popular downtown Portland restaurant temporarily closed its doors in March. But Tilden says despite some recent reports that the restaurant is permanently closing, it will reopen. Just in a smaller, fewer tables, more tavern-like style. The model that we know is, is done and we're going to do a takeout model. I'm going to be in the kitchen cooking because um, I don't have a staff and uh, my wife might come down and help me out a little bit. But permanent closures are happening. Several restaurants, including Helzer's on Alberta and Sparrow's Coffee in Selwood, announced on social media they would be permanently closing, as the Oregonian first reported. According to the latest count by the Oregon Restaurant and Lodging Association, since this pandemic started, 4% of restaurants have already permanently closed. 6% are expected to close in the next few weeks. And while many restaurants have been able to pivot to a takeout and delivery model, Many, like Clyde Common, had to close temporarily to rethink their future. That is correct. We are pivoting to survive. The bottom line is that if your favorite restaurant does choose to reopen when it's allowed to, it will be looking and operating a lot differently. And those not yet open are also facing a lot of unknowns. I'm going to just really see what's going on. Top Chef All-Star Gregory Gorday had plans to open his dream restaurant in Portland this winter. He says he still plans on opening it, but it's not going to be for a while. So hopefully, fingers crossed, you know, um, we can be in a much better place and I can open by next summer. A much better, albeit very different kind of place with fewer restaurants, fewer tables and fewer customers. But make no mistake, Portland's dining scene is not done. I, put, I borrowed money from every every person I could find and I put a stake in the ground and said we're doing this um, and uh, we're coming back. Keely Chalmers, KGW News. We talk a lot about healthcare workers needing PPE, but a local company figured out something else they need, socks. That's coming up.